Can we sing together this morning? We've got our kids joining us today. Um, we're really excited to just to lift high the name of Jesus in this place this morning. So let's worship together now. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in our sweet prayer. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. power in earth. We see your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, hurt the sick, the poor, That's our prayer today. God, build your kingdom here. Let's sing it. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness be. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. When this nation Change the atmosphere. today. That is our prayer. He heal our land, change our world. Let's continue in worship this morning, this Christmas season, as we just celebrate the fact that we know about Jesus, right? We know about him. So let's go and tell him, tell our friends and our neighbors and our, our loved ones and everybody else that we know the good news of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this out together. It might sound a little different than you used to, but this is Go Tell It on the mountain. Let's sing together. Let's sing this out while shepherds kept their watch.
go tell it on the mountain. Then go tell it. God, today, we thank you for that salvation you sent. We thank you that we have a hope that lasts. No matter what we face, we know that we can have true hope and true joy, real love, real peace in this season because of you, Jesus. So today, we just continue in worship to you. We honor you now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm Paul Bernard, and this is Cynthia Bernard. And today we are going to light the candle of love. Christ is the true love. Today we light the third candle of Advent. This is the candle of love. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most precious gift, his only son. May we not grow tired of hearing this familiar verse from the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 Now today we... Uh light this candle in honor and memory of uh, Mike. Um, you know, Paul and Cynthia have gone through a, a, an unbelievable week. But it's not a week without hope. It's not a week without joy. And it's sure it's not a week without love. Um, the love of God has been shown in their life. Um, Mike knew the love of God. Mike experienced the love of God. And because of that love of God, uh, Mike went home. So today we, we light this candle as a reminder of the love of God. But we light it in honor of and in memory of our dear friend, Mike Bernard. Father, thank you, God, for loving us before we could ever love you. We didn't even know where to start. We didn't even know how to begin. And God, in the beginning, you sent us a promise that that very, that very son, your only son, would come into this world. And he would do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And it's because, God, you loved this world. Father, for those who may be in this room and not sure about your love, God, may today they just know that you love them, that you're calling them to love you. And Father, may we leave here today knowing God that you have called us to love the people you love love the world that you love Lord I pray for um, for Paul and Cynthia I thank you God um, that we get to light this candle in honor and in memory of our friend mine in Jesus name Amen
How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing love the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Do you stand as we continue worshiping this morning? shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was a calm dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished on that cross we celebrate that love today the love that paid the debt we owed so that we can come before you and worship God and knowing that we've been made right we can walk in this life knowing we've been set free from sin set free to follow you and live in the way you would call us to we've been set free from brokenness, set free from loneliness, set free from bitterness in our hearts. God, help us to know that we've been set free because of your love today. And help us to choose you, Jesus. We love you. We honor you now. It's in your name we pray and we have sung this morning.
Amen. You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them and doing a Bible story or going through a scripture. To us, it's, it's spending life with them. It's living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them, sharing the truth with them. come to the city from the villages, they immediately are looking at in the face of the reality that they are invisible in the city. So the women are out there begging on the streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them, they don't even acknowledge them, they don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access to the embarrassed of people. And this project helps them provide jobs and it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry and she's really a leader among the community and we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We would go visit her every week and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for over three years and finally about two months ago she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus and we were able to baptize her in her community in front of the whole community and she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so that they can have enough information to follow Jesus. We just want to thank you all for giving to the Lottie Moon offering because without that we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We're able to focus on our ministry. We don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard. You know that um, next week we march to the manger. We give our annual Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal this year is $12,000. It seems like a lot of money, but it's really not. And we every year surpass that. So we will give throughout the month of December. And actually, we give all the way into January. But uh, next week we will march. So as a family, be praying about how you're going to march together and bring that offering together um, uh, for our um, Annie Armstrong, uh, I mean our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Um, I misspoke a while ago and um, I was r reminded by two s different ladies in our church that I misspoke. The visitation is at 12 noon and the service is at 1 and um, uh, Cynthia thought, well, maybe we just changed the time and didn't tell her. <laughs> but Cynthia wasn't the one that reminded me. Mommy in the back reminded me, Earlene. And young daughter over here reminded me. So, uh, Erica. Um, so today, if you'll take your Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we're in uh, the series, Living in Between the Advents. You know, we, we talked about, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this whole idea of, of hope. You know, we said from the very beginning, you know, you can live 40 days without water. You know, you can live seven days without food, eight days, uh, um, uh, eight minutes without air, but you can't live one second without hope. Now, you can live, but you're not really living. You're existing. And one of the things that I think is beautiful about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that, is that God wants us to live. In fact, when the Bible says that I have come that you might have life and life abundantly, the word for life is the word zoe. It's not the word bios. You know, mommy and daddy did that, you know, on a stormy night, uh, made bios happen, right? Nine months later, we were born, or however many months, you know, we were, we were born. Bios, biological. Kids learned that in sixth grade, right? 
But zoe is something God, only God can do. That is the life, the abundant life, the supernatural life that only God can give us. Nobody else can give us. Mommy and daddy can't give us that life. Only God can give us that life. And yet that's what Jesus came. He came to give us life. So while we live in between the advents, we realize that, that the first coming has already taken place. Christ has come. And we await the next coming when Christ is coming again. And we are to live with that waiting and that anticipation as we wait on his coming. And that's what we're going to talk about just for a little bit today is how do we live in between the advents? And how does love play a big part in waiting? You know, I was, uh, I was at the, well, I found out two things. First of all, there, there are two things that I should not have access to. One of them is the church sign. I should not have access to that sign. And I put things on that sign and I just pray to God. Nobody comes by. I just do it for a photo op, right? The second thing is a phone with a photo sensor on it. And I was waiting this week in a, in a waiting room and I looked up and, and I saw something and I couldn't help but take a picture of it. There was, a, there was a lady in the waiting room and she was waiting and I was waiting and she had her leg cocked up and there's a picture of this maybe. There it is. I don't know if you can see it, but it says sexy, right? Every part of that is sexy, isn't it, right? <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you go up above it, it don't get no better than down below it. It's just not. And, and, and what I learned from that, if I've got to wear that, then I ain't that, right? <laughs> but I think, man, while we're waiting, while we are waiting, we get caught up in everything else and, and the superficial things of this life. I was, I don't know if you drove by in front of this church yesterday morning. But I, they're across the street at the package store. Did you see that? That is a phenomenon, right? They've been waiting since Thursday. They've been camping out over there since Thursday. So I called them up. I said, before they opened, I said, dude, are y'all giving away free puppies today? What are you doing? I said, oh, no, we're not giving away. People won't stand in line for puppies. I was just being facetious. And she said, but they will stand in line for days for alcohol or for liquor. I said, what kind of liquor is it? She said, it's an aged bourbon. It's supposed to be smooth. And she went into detail telling me about the samples they were giving. I only stood from over here to take the picture for fear that I would get there and see somebody I know standing in that line. <laughs> and you know who you are. You know who you are. Waiting. People wait for a lot of things in this life. Wait. When you read the narrative of the birth of Jesus Christ, there in the Gospel of Luke that tells a story about Simeon, a prophet of God, and the prophet of God made this statement. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout and waiting. Three words describe him. Righteous, devout, Waiting. That's who Simeon was. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he sees the Lord's Christ. And he, and, and, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed him. He said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for a redeemer to be born. He had served over and over again as a prophet, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden he said, I can die. Why? Because I have seen the Lord's Christ. 
I have seen the consolation of Israel. And right after that, it tells a, a little brief story about, about Anna, a prophetess. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Femuel of, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple. She was worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to whom who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There's a prophet named Simeon. There's a prophetess named Anna. They've been serving in that temple. According to how you read it, 84 years as a widow, maybe. Not even leaving, leaving the complex, possibly. But she'd been waiting and waiting and waiting. And there she saw the Lord's Christ. And can I tell you, the wait was over. She waited for Jesus. And those of us that, that have the luxury of living in this moment and this day, we can look back and know that people waited for his first coming, but we're waiting for his next coming. We're waiting for Christ to come again. And as the Gospel of Matthew paints this image of Christ coming the first time, we also learn something from Joseph and from Mary and from Jesus that, that love should be that driving motivation of everything we do in our life. That, that we can give without loving, but we can't love without giving. I mean, isn't that so true today? I mean, you can give and never love that person. But if you love that person, your whole life is going to be about giving to that person because you love them. And we'll see that as it's unpacked in the scripture today. First of all, I want you to think about this, this, this Christ who is our true hope. He is our true joy, but he's also our true love. John 11 tells us a little bit about this true love Christ. John 11 says that there was a man that was sick. His name was Lazarus. He lived in, in Bethany. He lived with his sister Martha and Mary. And Mary was one who anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And so the sister sent a message to him, said, Lord, the one you love is sick. That's Jesus, right? I mean, here these sisters are sending a message from Bethany. Go find Jesus. And this, Jesus said, no, just tell him the one that he loves is sick. That could have been anybody. But Jesus knew who they were talking of. And they sent that message. So when Jesus heard it, the scripture says that when he heard it, this, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but will end for the glory of God. In that same chapter 11 of John, we find that shortest verse, Jesus whelp. And then we find right after that in verse 36, where he said, when the Jews said, so he the Jews said unto, about Jesus, see how much he truly loved him. See, that's, that's this Christ who is our true love. If you really knew how much Jesus really did love you, I mean, I'm not talking about liking you, because there are a lot of things that are unlikable about all of us, right? But when he loves us and he sees us not from what we've been, but what we can become. And he loves us with that unbelievable, everlasting love. If we just could understand the true love of God by the true love of Christ. And would it not change everything about how we live our life? It changed everything in Joseph's life. Joseph was a man in his day whose primary objective in living out his life was that he would have a good reputation. 
Today, the culture of our day, I just want to be famous. I want an influencer. I want a YouTuber. I want a TikToker. I want somebody to come alongside me and I want somebody to push me down the road and make me something that I'm not. But that wasn't true in Joseph's day. Joseph held on to that Ecclesiastes 7 passage where he says that a good name is better than the best perfume. He said, I, I, want, I want to be that person who spends out his life. I want to have a good reputation. Joseph had a good reputation. He was not qualified to be the earthly father of the Lord Jesus if he had not already had that good reputation. That's who he was. And the Bible says that, that even before they came, became husband and wife, he was betrothed to Mary. He, he was engaged, so to speak, to Mary. But the engagement was a lot different than our engagement. You know, our engagement, we go out and she buys dinner and we say, we're going to marry her. And then we get married and we drive to the courthouse and, and some guy with bad breath looks us in the eye and asks us two questions and we get it notarized and we walk out of there legal. That's it, right? Wasn't like that in Joseph's day. In fact, parents made the decision on who their child was going to marry. The parents got together, and in this case, it was a small town. Nazareth was a small town, maybe three to 500 people max. So there probably wasn't a lot of availability. It wasn't choice A, B, C, D. It's probably these, these people got together, Joseph's family, Mary's family. They got together, and they said, hey, I've got, you got, I've got a son, you got a daughter, and they, I believe they would be good for each other. And they were betrothed to each other. Sometimes they would betrothed to each other and without even first meeting each other and being around each other. That's why they gave a whole year of the patrol to just getting to know each other. You know, most people like us, when we have problems in our marriage, we have a cooling off period, right? We need to separate. We need to not talk for a while. We need to call it a truce. We need to call in a mediator. We need somebody to intervene on our behalf. We have to cool off. Because we said things we don't mean. Or maybe we said things we, we did mean when we were mean. But we said it anyway, right? But in Joseph's day, there was a whole year warming up to each other. Getting to know each other. Making promises to each other. They didn't live together. They didn't have relations together. They were betrothed. Technically, they were married. In fact, if they broke off in the betrothal period, they would have to get a divorce. Even though they didn't share a house together and they didn't share a common bed together. See, that, they were betrothed to each other. They were waiting for the day of their wedding. To consummate their marriage. And yet the Bible says this is that guy. This is that guy that true love waits. This is that guy that says we're going to give, we're going to get to know each other. We're going to get married and have a ceremony. We are already betrothed, but we're going to get to know each other and warm up to each other. And we're going to learn what it's going to mean to spend the rest of our life with each other. You see, that's Joseph. Joseph demonstrated unbelievable love because it was during that betrothal period in that engagement time that Mary found out that she was pregnant of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph had a lot of choices to make. I mean, he could have done what Deuteronomy said, brought her before the crowd and, and had her stoned to death. He could have killed her. Or he could have just ignored it and said, hey, I, I'm guilty. I'm the sinner and took the fall for, for the baby. Or he could have just did what he wanted to do, being a good man. A man that loved her, just put her away privately. So she's not hurt any more than she is. See, we, at that time, the angel had not come to Joseph. The angel had come to Mary, but not to Joseph. And for all Joseph knew, Mary had been fooling around. And Joseph, being a righteous man, a just man, a waiting man, all of these things Joseph was, right? 
waiting for that year to end or that betrothal period. And yet, here he is. And the Bible says in verse number 18, the birth of Jesus, in, in Matthew 1, verse 18, the birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged or betrothed to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to grace her publicly, decided, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to kill her. I'm not going to shame her anymore. I'm going to divorce her qu quietly and let her slip off to another town and live with her aunt or do something like that. But I'm just going to let her just slip by. I loved her. I, got, I warmed up to her. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. But what's best for her is to move on. And yet the scripture says, But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has done this, Joseph. No man, God man, God did this, Joseph. This virgin is going to bring into this world the promise of the Messiah that you've been waiting for and you, the way will be over in a few short months. And the Bible tells us this Joseph, this Joseph, the son of David, he said, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing when you think about it. The scripture declares to us that, that it was in that very moment that the angel of the Lord came to him and appeared to him in a dream. Not a awake dream, but a night dream. And in that dream, the angel came and explained to Joseph everything that was going to happen and everything that needed to happen and the fulfillment of what Isaiah said. Behold, a virgin shall conceive with a child and his name shall be called Jesus. That's what Isaiah had prophesied 700 years earlier. And, and Joseph was going to have the front row seat in all of that happening. And what the Bible teaches us is that Joseph truly loved Mary. But I'm telling you, Joseph couldn't truly love Mary until he truly loved God. See, those of us that are having these emotional love issues in our life and our relationships with our kids, our family, or, or we're, you know, wringing our hands about family gatherings at Christmas, and man, I just don't know. I love them, but I don't like being around them and all that. But you know what? What would happen if we just said, God, I, I want to love you with everything I have, and I want what I love in you to come out in me as I love others. Joseph did that. That was a demonstration of that unbelievable love. And the Bible says that, that Mary, she demonstrated love as well. I mean, think about it. The Bible says in, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it gives us an image of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It said that, 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 that when, when Jesus was born in, Bethle uh, uh, in Bethlehem's manger, the Bible says, and Mary brought forth her firstborn child, and Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and Mary laid him in the manger. That tells you of the birth. But it doesn't really tell you of all that she went through from the moment of conception to the birth. Small town girl, everybody with an opinion. Everybody snickering, everybody laughing, everybody have, have, say, oh, poor, pitiful Joseph. You know, and, and Mary overlooked, and yet all the while Mary's doing what Mary was sent to do. And that is that she was providing a safe place for the birth of Jesus. She slept well, she ate well, she cared for her body well. Because within her, she knew that Jesus would be born. 
Can I tell you that to me is a beautiful picture of this love that Mary has. And that love didn't just end at birth. I mean, she didn't just do her job and walk off. She stayed with him all the way to the bitter end. When everybody and their brother had ran and hid for fear that they would be the link to Jesus and be crucified like unto Jesus, they hid off in the distance. But what did Mary do? It was Mary the mother, right, that came. It was Mary the mother that witnessed the death of her son. It was Mary. That love was a demonstration of a love that she loved God, that she automatically was going to love God's son. That's love. That's the love of God. That is the love that we should have in our life for the things of God. Because if I love God and I love his son, the Lord Jesus, then I'm going to love what God and Jesus loves. And the last time I checked, they love the same thing. They love. And we love what they love. They love the world. The scripture says, as Paul read just a moment ago, that age old verse of scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible tells us that when Mary and Joseph took out that journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, some 85 miles or so, she was great with child. They get there. I mean, Bethlehem is swollen to capacity. There was no room for them except for the inn. And there Jesus was born and wrapped in grave clothes and laid in a feeding trough. What kind, of love, what kind of mother would do that to a child? The kind of mother that would let God lead her life. Mary demonstrated an unbelievable love. And the scripture declares to us more than anything in the whole world. In verse 21 where it says that she will give birth to a son and you shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That is the most beautiful passage in the birth narrative of Christ. He's going to get a name. His name is Jesus. What's he going to do? He's going to save Who's he going to save? He's going to save the world. Who's he going to, what's he going to save the world from? He's going to save the world from their sins. That's what Jesus does. That's the love of Christ. That's the demonstration of the love of Christ. Christ Jesus is the true love. He is the one who loves us. And he loves us in our darkness. He loves us in our pain. He loves us in our sadness. He loves us in every possible way. He loves us. The scripture paints pictures of the love of God. When it says that in Galatians 2, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. This is how it ends. Who loved me and gave himself for me? He loved me and he gave himself for me. He demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, he died for us. He loved me and he gave himself for me. So today as we walk through this advent of love, we don't just celebrate a word. We celebrate the life of love, Jesus. We celebrate the fact that we could not love if Jesus didn't love in us. We don't know how to love apart from the love of Christ. And one day life will come to a close. And the only thing that's going to ever matter is what we've done with this one who has loved us and gave himself for us. 
This past Monday was, uh, was a day of all days for Cynthia and, and Paul and for Mike. Mike's last official act with his family was watching our worship night here on live stream on Sunday night. Mike and I have had a lot of conversations through the years, especially through the sick years. He was holding out, fighting, doing whatever he could because he wanted to live for his family. But he knew that life was going to creep up on him and his health was deteriorating. In fact, it's just overcame him. So Paul and Cynthia and myself got to go back in one of the trauma rooms. There's nothing more beautiful to me when a man who's lived his life and has faith in Christ, surrounded by his family who has faith in Christ, they just want to be with him when he goes to be with Jesus. So Cynthia on one arm and Paul on the other arm and myself holding on to his feet. All of a sudden, nothing. He was no longer there. It's just a shell. I looked up on the wall and I, I pulled out that old dreaded phone and I took a picture of the clock on the wall in that unit. When I took that picture, I I wanted to make it a memory in my mind that don't ever forget 1227. Because it's just like, just like that moment. At that very moment, while we're standing there, he's entered into his home. He's home. He's safe at home. He's forever home, never to pick up and move again. He is home, and he's only home because of Jesus. He cannot be home because my, uh, his wife loved him or his son loved him. He can only be home because he knew the love of Christ. Because only Christ and the love of Christ can get us home. Do you know that love? Do you know the love of Jesus? Have you trusted Jesus with your whole life? Do you love him so much that you want to change everything to follow him? Is Christ Jesus your true love? Is he the one you wake up to every day? You go to bed with every night knowing that your life belongs to him? Do you live your life with that constant over, overarching reminder in your mind and your daily routine of life that my life belongs to Jesus? Because if it don't belong to Jesus, then it's going to belong just to you. And friend, without Jesus, you are a horrible manager. But with Christ, he's the perfect manager. He manages our heartbeats, our daily life, our routines, our missteps, our hiccups, whatever it is. God will use every possible thing in our life to glorify him the most. Who sinned? Was it his mommy or his daddy? The disciples asked of the kid that was born, the man that was born crippled. Jesus said, neither one of them sinned. This guy was born this way for the glory of God. Whatever it is in your life that you just think, man, if I could shed this, I'd be free. Won't you just give it to him? So that maybe God can use this. And I'm going to give it to him for the glory of God. Let's pray. Over the last two weeks, uh, 
quoted Ironside's statement that Christ is a substitute for everything. But nothing is a substitute for Christ. Nothing. The things that you think you can't live without, you can. But you cannot have life without Jesus. Whatever you have that just owns you, or you just think, man, I just got to have this, this, and this. Listen, why don't you exchange all of that and say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I don't want to let my life be, the sum of my life be the things of this life. I'm giving you my life. I'm trusting you. I'm believing that you have the power to forgive me and cleanse me and change me. I want what you want for me. I want what you want for me. Have your way in me. Father, may this be that moment. That defining moment in all of our lives where we realize, God, that that you can be trusted with everything. For some of us, God, we need to be re-reminded of that. But for some today, they put off and put off. They've liked you. They've kind of been a little bit impressed with you. But they've never truly trusted you. And today, may this be that turning point where they say, yes, Jesus, I believe. Yes, Jesus, I believe that you love me. Yes, Jesus, I turn from my sin. And yes, Jesus, I trust you to be my true love. Change our hearts, oh God. Make us more like you. For these next few moments, we're going to stand. I'm going to stand down front in front of the manger. If you, God is speaking to your life and you just need someone to pray with you, pray for you. If you're ready to, to make a public declaration that Christ is your Savior, that you want to follow him, what's left of your life. This is a great opportunity to let God lead you.
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.